This is Chewing the Gristle, a poetry chat. My name is Al Black, and my co-host is the poet, Tim Conroy. Welcome, Tim. My brother Al, how are you doing today? Great. We have a wonderful interview today with the poet and educator, David Kaplan. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. I'm really uh, excited to talk to you about poetry today. Yes. David Kaplan is the author of six books of literary criticism and poetry, most recently his second poetry collection, Into My Garden, Maureen N. McLean Praise the Poems, A Searing, Shimmering Lucidity. Among its many offerings, David Kaplan's Into My Garden delicately, precisely, unforgettably tracks the fear and love informing Jewish study and longing. Stephanie Burt observed, these remarkable poems blend spiritual unease with religious confidence, an investigator's fascinated spirit with a sense that the poet has almost but not quite come home. The Charles M. Weiss Professor of English at Ohio Wesleyan University, Kaplan twice served as a Fulbright lecturer in American literature and received the Virginia Quarterly Review's Emily Clark Balk Prize for Poetry and an Individual Excellence Award for Criticism from the Ohio Arts Council. David, talk to us about your poetry journey. You know, the your journey as a poet, your early influences, how you got into it, who informed you as a poet? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. And it's, a, it's as you imagine, it's a complicated journey. I was unusual as a child because I preferred reading poetry more than fiction. Most readers prefer reading novels. Later in life, I came to novels. I love reading novels also. So I was reading all poetry. And, you know, poetry, when you first come to it, it's confusing, it's overwhelming, you don't know what to make of it. So one of the first poets I read was T.S. Eliot. I remember reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, you know, let us go then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. I had no idea what it meant. I really, maybe I could have told you it was about sexual frustration, which probably is a, is a sophomore in high school was a subject near and dear to me. But beyond that, I couldn't have told you. But I knew that I was really moved by it. Now, finally, you know, um, Eliot himself, that poetry can be appreciated before it's understood. And that was my experience of having this intense experience of poetry. I grew up in a suburb near Boston. I have parents who were not poetry fans, but they liked to read, and they certainly were interested in supporting their children's interests. So we went to some poetry readings. So I saw Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the beat poet who just sadly passed away recently, and Allen Ginsberg and some other, Donald Hall, some other poets of that generation. Then I went to college and I went to Hobart and William Smith College, which fortunately for me had a wonderful um, poetry writing, had a lot of poets on, on, on staff who were wonderful teachers. So I studied with um, James Krenner and David Weiss and Deborah Tall, all of whom really were very um, inspirational. And then I started getting a more sophisticated understanding of poetry. I started to understand what I wanted to do. And I think my poetry is more and more interested in what it's like to be at a certain time and a place, what it's like to be in a particular room for a certain person in a room or walking down a street. That person may or may not be me, often it's not. Sometimes it's someone a little bit like me. Uh, and then as I wrote more and more, I started, I went to graduate school and now I teach poetry. And I started getting more interested in other forms of reading that aren't poetry and what that's like. So in other words, my latest book is set in a yeshiva, which is a um, institute for rabbinic studies, where a uh, Hasidic yeshiva, where kind of stringently observant uh, men who are coming out of a mystical approach to Judaism study ancient texts. And I was struck by the intensity of that reading experience there and how it's both similar and different to poetry. So I'm interested kind of when things collide in a poem, in a particular place where there's certain intensity. And it need not be a dramatic action, but it's someone kind of wrestling with an idea. So, and again, even that formative experience of reading Eliot's poetry, I still love his poetry. Hopefully I understand it better now. 
but it left me with the impression that a poem can really be wildly expressive, dramatically expressive before it's understood. And that's an idea that I think is central to my understanding of poetry. I think one reason why people are shy away from poetry is in high school or in uh, junior high, they read a poem and they say, what does this poem mean? And the teacher asks, and they say, well, it's about you know this, the poem, and the teacher says, no, you're wrong. What the poem means is, is often, you know, one of the least interesting aspects about the poem. Poems don't so much state a thesis as so much as dramatize an emotion or an idea. So I think you have to understand kind of what it's, the idea is expressing, but that's where discussion begins. And certainly making uh, uh, the appreciation of poem into a right or wrong experience really is a way um, to injure people's appreciation of poetry. No one leaves a basketball game watching a basketball game and anyone asks them, you know, uh, what was that game about? You know, and they say, well, it's about the Celtics winning and they say wrong. It's just not the way we appro pro approach most intense, enjoyable events in our lives. So I really feel that people should be enjoying poetry, getting over the anxiety of what it means, while of course attending to the ideas that the poem is expressing or testing out. Thank you, Tam. David, let's talk about your collection Into the Garden and talk about the collection's cohesion a little bit and what you wanted to convey. Sure. Well, I mentioned a little bit. It really, most of it traces a person who's both me and unlike me in many different ways. He's studying at a, um, a, uh, a Hasidic yeshiva. Again, this is a institute for kind of rabbinic studies where all male, where uh, they study ancient texts, including the Talmud, uh, and also texts that are more recent that are kind of mystical, they explore kind of the mystical notions of Judaism. The texts are in Aramaic, Hebrew, in some cases Yiddish. So the speaker who is, is struggling to kind of um, understand these texts and to grapple with them and is wrestling with large issues in life. So I wanted to, one reason why I, I thought of this was in, in addition to the kind of intensity of experience that one has in a place like that, I find in general, American literature does a very bad job at depicting traditionally religious people. They're showed to be purely bigots or holy spiritual beings. I'm traditionally observant Jew. Some, I live in a community of like that way. None of my friends are that way. They're all, they're all human beings. They're a mixture of, you know, of, of trying to do good things, um, thwarted by uh, their, thwarted by their desires not to. I mean, they're, just, just, they're, human, they're human beings aspiring to be better. So I wanted to put someone in this spot, make him different than me. He was younger. He's a runner. I made him a runner because I wanted him to go on runs and he could think about things and have this really intense experience of this place while wrestling with these large issues that are both focused in these very kind of tangible ways. So that the book kind of traces that narrator coming into the yeshiva, um, experiencing certain things there, and then leaving and then trying to assimilate that intense experience outside, um, outside of that environment. Um, so so con conceptually, you knew you wanted to write this collection, or did you write a series of poems first? Uh -huh. And then it yeah. came about. I How did that happen? Sure. I think for me, and for most poets, the general, general exceptions, is you write, you know, you have something, you think, oh, that's not made an interesting poem. And you play around with it. And of course, the poem that you write often has little to do with the poem that you think you're going to write. But I thought this is a kind of interesting place. Particularly, you have those lot of like little images that I thought. So for example, in, in the study hall, at the back of the study hall, is portraits of the previous spiritual leaders of this particular Hasidic sect. I thought that's really interesting where you're praying with these images of these men, of these holy, intense, spiritual people looking at you. Now, when I started writing that poem, I didn't know where I was going to go. So then what happened was I wrote one poem, you know, and I find, well, this is going pretty well. And then at the time, there's a, there's a journal called the Virginia Quality Review that I contribute poems to. And the editor at the time liked to send poets to different places and have them with a photographer. So I, I asked him, would you be interested in this? And I sent him the poems. He said, sure. So I went with the photographer and that helped me because I was watching 
that place through the eyes of a photographer. So I was kind of looking at images and how he framed it. Photographer Noah Rabinowitz is his name. And he came up with a lot of very interesting photos. So that kind of inspired me a little bit more because I had a different way of approaching this experience. And then at a certain point, I thought, well, wow, geez, this seems like it could be a book. And so then at that point, I started, you know, trying to think a little bit more systematically. But I'd say for most of the poems, you know, there's a, there's a line by Robert Lowe says, my eye has seen what my hand has done. My eye has seen what my hand has done. And I think when you're writing poems, at least for me, that's three quarters of it, you know. And if if I say beforehand, oh, I know what this poem's going to do. I'm going to move this scene and I move these five things and I'm done. That poem's going to be terrible. It's one of those poems I write and I'll think it's fantastic. And I'll read it the next day and I'll think, this is just nothing's happening. You, know, you, you have to, at least for me, you have a little impulse. You play around with it. I think for some of my students, that's what I encourage them to do. It's that's why poetry, writing of poetry is both exciting and frustrating for people uh, trying it for the first time, because you kind of have to see what the poem wants to do. You know, whereas very much other things, you know, you go to the gym, you know, you work out, you do your workout, you, you're consistent, you're going to get stronger. There's a poem, you're trying different things out and seeing where it's going to go. Well, how about uh, let us hear a few of these poems? Sure. So why don't I read one poem, which is it's titled Even the Thief. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quasi sonnet, a kind of imitation of a sonnet. And one thing I like about the sonnet form is you have it, an idea and a counter idea. So you have an argument and a counter argument. And that always struck me as very true to life. In other words, you don't just have one idea, you're always kind of wrestling with things. This, uh, the title comes from a paradox that some of the uh, Jewish sages wrestled with, which is that a, a thief, praise for success before he tries to steal something. So the paradox is, if the thief believes in God, why is he stealing? He shouldn't be stealing. God says, don't, don't steal. If he doesn't believe in God, why is he praying? And to me, this is a kind of interesting, this is an interesting paradox. And this poem is also, again, from the point of view of the speaker, who's wrestling very much with his theological questions, surrounded by people, to his mind, that he doesn't think are, although I suspect they are too, but just not, um, not just voicing them. And this is set in the study hall, which is this you know, intense experience, intense uh, place of textual study. So again, it's called, it's called Even the Thief. One other thing you should know is that in traditional Judaism, tattoos are, are forbidden or prohibited because the idea is, among others, you don't own your body. So the body, so therefore to be making marks on your body would be, um, would be um, marring something that doesn't belong to you. So even the thief. A night of snow, no one expected. This late, the study hall sounds different. The same words said again, dark and glowing. A window scratched with its mistakes. Everyone knows God controls the universe. My study, trans my study partner translates without a pause. Even the thief prays for success. To know what you feel, not what you ought to feel. Is there anything harder? At the airport, a man with the book of Genesis tattooed down his leg boarded in front of me. And I couldn't help but wonder how it would feel to have those words that close. So partly what I liked about this is just the line, you know, to know what you feel, not what you ought to feel. Is there anything harder? You know, because he's really trying to figure out both what he actually believes, what he actually feels, not necessarily what the secular world is telling him, what not necessarily what this particular environment is telling him. And then finally, I liked what I wanted to do at the end was uh, have this image of having, these, of having the Bible that close and having the words that close. Now, ironically or paradoxically, it's in a way in which the speaker would never do because they're tattooed on this man's leg. And so I also like the idea for several reasons um, um, that he was looking for a uh, model outside of traditional Judaism. Because again, I find that's true to life. And I find that depictions of Orthodox Jews make them hugely judgmental in, in, in simplistic ways that they often are not. So I like the idea of this, the speaker looking at this tattoo and thinking, oh, you know, what a feel to have those words that close. Mm -hmm. Let me read one other short poem, 
which is about, uh, since I mentioned it uh, before a little bit, um, the Im image in the back of the study hall has these um, images of the uh, paintings of the previous leaders of this Hasidic sect. And so I'm trying to get in this poem, the intense experience of prayer in that environment. So it's called only the Hebrew. One other thing to keep in mind is the speaker's wrestling with the language difficulties with praying in Hebrew. They, he's starting to learn uh, also studying in texts that are in Aramaic and Hebrew and Yiddish. So only the Hebrew. The sudden quiet of a room emptied of noise, only the Hebrew, a stone on his tongue. The boy who carried his suitcase up the stairs swayed as if into a thought. What is holy? No walls of Jerusalem stone, no microphone discreetly cl clipped across a lapel to announce when to stand. The more you need them, the more words demand. Wind so, wind, window sills honored with books, pictures of the righteous watching. And again, to me, is the more you need them, the more words demand. Whereas it seemed that the speaker really needs words to do something with that for him to help him, but is finding that they're making more demands upon it. And one of the things just about this poem is he's asking what is holy. And to him, that seems one of his central questions, trying to figure out what is holy and, and what isn't. You know, I, I love those thought provoking poems. They're really uh, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think you alluded to it in, in one of your answers, but speak to us about revision and your process. And is a poem ever done? A poem's done for me when I can't think of any ways to make it better. And every change that I'm making is, seems to be making it worse. Right. So I'd say a poem is is I'm done with the poem. The poem might not be done and a poem may be done, but not perfect. In other words, when I get to the point where I say, oh, maybe I'll change this. And, I, and you know, one thing that I, I think aspiring all kinds of poets do and all, all poets should do is keep your drafts because you know, you're working away, you're working away. Then you, then you go back and you say, oh, my second draft was so much better than it was now. And the question is, how do you feel about your second draft? If that's as good as I can get it, then it's done. I would say my, my process is really trying things out, moving things around. Um, you know, you have an idea. Often for me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a character in a particular place, in a particular moment. And then you, I try something and it works. To a certain extent, but doesn't another. Maybe I give you an example uh, of a particular poem, because this might be helpful. So my first collection is titled, In the World He Created According to His Will. So this is from the Jewish prayer for, uh, for the dead called Kaddish, titled Kaddish, which is, uh, I was struck by that line because it's in the world he created according to his will. So half of it is saying, affirming God in the world he created. But then a lot of that um, collection struggled with the kind of pain in this world. So if this is if this God if God created this world according to His will, then how do you deal with it's the old question of theodicy? How do you deal with the question of suffering? So this my grandfather towards the end of his life, um, I, I grew up in the same town that he lived in, although he was born in what's now the Ukraine, came to America uh, as a boy, and at the end of his life he was in poor health. My mother took him into our house and kind of cared for him selflessly, and so I started the poem after he passed away, which image of him walking down the block on our, on our street. And it had some nice lines, but it wasn't working that well. So we lived in a town near the ocean. My, my, my mother still lives in that town. So then I had him walking by the ocean. He, every day he would go for like, a, he walked for like a block to try to get a little exercise. And that went a little bit better. And then I, my next draft had me walking with him, which I certainly had done many times by the ocean. And I found all these different opportunities arose. So again, you begin with an idea, an image of my grandfather going for a walk by himself. Then that gives certain lines, certain images, but doesn't seem to work so well. And then I kind of maneuver things around and then more possibilities will arise. So if you don't mind, I can read that poem so people can hear. So again, this is the, my, from my first collection. This is the title poem. It's titled, In the World He Created According to His Will. And it's dedicated to Paul Germain, who is my grandfather, my uh, maternal grandfather. It's in three very short sections. One, 
The fishermen return in light so pure. They barely see the bay beneath their dories. The familiar shimmering where, mor where morning burns to afternoon, spring, almost to summer. So they row by row toward the spindly-legged pier, the seawall shading the beach to mud. You, waking, looking at me as if I too were water. Two. Our pace is too pedestrian to disturb the seagulls on rails loading over us. The sidewalk is an upturned palm, its lifelines longer than towns. Waving off my elbow, you tell me something so softly I cannot hear it above the low tide midsummer whispers of the surf. So softly a joke is a story, a story of question. I wish I knew how to listen harder without pity not only to you. Your hand grips my arm. We walk shorter, slower. Three, you're stronger today. The staccato mumble of wind help rain that I wake to is you praying in the next bedroom. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. What returns you to these words in the pause between tides, the rising and falling back, not only of water? Too tired you quiet. Past the harbor, trawlers wait for their nets to fill. The familiar shallows beneath their lead ballasted keels, always shifting. So those are the kind of poems I like to write. You can see how I like to get other people in the poems, and I very much like to incorporate the place and what's going on in the place. So in the town that I grew up in, on the North Shore of Boston, I had fishermen was by the ocean and kind of the, the rhythms of that town counterbalanced against my grandfather's declining health. Hmm. That's very, very nicely done. And, and thank you for the explanation leading into it. Talk to us about what poets you're reading now and who is informing David Kaplan's writing. <laughs> well, I can tell you whom I think is informing my writing, right? But of course, you know, in some ways we're you know, invisible to our most profound influences, both in poetry, I guess, and in life. So uh, there's certain poets I've always liked. And, and some of them, I would say, influenced me. Some of them haven't. So I mentioned T.S. Eliot. I've always enjoyed his poetry. You know, Eliot, there was a debate that arose over Eliot's anti-Semitism, whether or not I should be considered anti-Semitic or not, in person, on, on the page. I came to the conclusion that some of his lines are, uh, should be thought to be anti, classified as anti-Semitic. So the Jew squats on the sill, its owner is one of the, uh, is one of the eyes. It's, it's, you know, it's a little opaque, obscure, so it's not a direct line. So for me, from the beginning, influences have always been a complicated matter. Whereas I've had influence with people which I love, who I realize if they met me, we might not enjoy each other's company. Although Eliot, to be fair to him, had met, had friends who were Jews, you know, so he seems in his mind to have certain views of, of, of Jews, whereas in person, he, he, he treated people differently. In my latest collection, I have, a, I have a series of poems about Ezra Pound, whose poetry I love, who was a fascist in a literal sense, made broadcast for the Italian fascist government. So you can see how, for me, influence is not simply, oh, I love your poetry, I love you, I want to write like you. So to me, it's most interesting when you're wrestling with something. More happily, I, I studied with the poet Donald Justice. I've always loved his work. Um, I've always loved Derek Walcott's po poetry, who is a West Indian, whose poetry I think is uh, beautiful and it has a kind of beautiful cadence and sound. And so I, I kind of aspire to have some lines that may sound a tenth as beautiful as the lines that he writes. Um, you know, and there's just so many different poets that I, that I read that, I, that whose work I love that kind of, I'm enthusiastic about them, I'm not sure that influenced my work. There's one poet, you know, who's also a good friend, Yoshua November, who's the only other poet that I know of who's really writing poems, I would say, out of Hasidic culture in some ways. His poems are very different. He has a large family. His poems are very much the day-to-day -day life of, in those communities. But I, and his poems are also tend to be more narrative and kind of on the line, kind of flatter. He's more interested in kind of telling a story and I'd say the musicality of a line. Um, I love his poetry too, and I'm sure um, you know he's influenced influenced my poetry in ways that I haven't perceived. Just because I think he's someone 
closer to what some of the issues that I'm wrestling with, where someone like Elliot and Pound, uh, the profound influences on me, but partly through the distance between their work and their lives and mine. So would you share another poem with us? Sure. Why don't I share a poem um, about the, from the manuscript I'm working on now? So I had mentioned- That would be wonderful. Great. So I, as I mentioned, I grew up on the, uh, uh, on a, in, a, in a suburb of the North Shore of Boston, a small town called Swampscott. Uh, and my uh, family have lived there for, for a few generations. It's a uh, place, I live in Ohio now. So I've started to kind of think back upon my childhood there. My father passed away last year, so I started writing a lot of elegies for him. You know, I, without even thinking about it. And before I realized, I basically almost had a book length of elegies. And they really incorporated what it was like growing up in that place. And my mother grew up, my mother was born, and really um, thinking about my father. I wanted to do a couple of different things in these elegies. I wanted to show a kind man facing the end of life, which is very unusual in elegies. Normally they have more dramatic or... Um, and sometimes aggressive postures to the deceased. Also, I wanted to show how um, uh, the, my father passed away of Alzheimer's related complications and my mother cared for him and how the death of someone of a loved family member is felt within a family, not just within the poet or the, the deceased. So let me, let me be, I'll, I'll read two short poems if you don't mind. So one is called Master Bedroom. And it's, you'll see it's very much my mother caring for my father towards the end of his life. So Master Bedroom. One of the tricks my mother learned, she hired a contractor to expand the bathroom with a shower big enough for her and my father because he needed her there to clean him. Her voice, the only one he recognized, repeating, it's okay, when he grabbed her wrist. What does she think on mornings like this, responsible only to herself, showering in that big space inside the glass door she chose so she could watch him while she dried her hair, all the bathroom's puzzles cleared away like his things beside the sink, the puzzle of how to convince him to open his mouth so she could brush his teeth, keep still so she could shave him. And probably I wanted to honor the people who really take care of family members selflessly at the end of their lives. And I felt that that wasn't really acknowledged um, in, in elegies. I finally read another short poem, it's called Kitchen. And again, you can just get a sense from the titles, you know, master bedroom and kitchen, how domestic, how much I want this to be about the kind of actual places where people live. And um, so again, it's titled Kitchen. When, when my mother asked, do you know who this is? My father turned his head to find the right angle. Pointing, she said the first sound in my name and the ripped out back wall returned to the kitchen, the tall cabinets of my childhood that I could not reach, a blue ceramic bowl drying upside down beside the sink. All those years, I could not wait to get away. David, David, my mother repeated, drawing out the two syllables like a spell. If I am I, because you are you, and you are you, because I am I, and I am not I, and you are not you, a great mystic taught his students. But isn't it always true of fathers and sons? I am I, because you are you, even after the father does not recognize his son, and the son realizes everything in life is learned too late. And just kind of what, 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 as I was reading these two poems here, I realized both of them ends with, ends with questions. And I think that's also partly what I'm interested in is kind of probing this experience that I don't have answers for. That's wonderful. Tim. Hey, David, let's dig into the craft a little bit and talk to us about, I'm gonna set you up for rhymes challenge. Okay. Um, talk about the challenges of using rhyme in poetry. Ah, well, Rhyme Challenge, as you mentioned, thank you very much for referring to it. It's a scholarly book that I wrote, and I wrote on rhyme and hip hop, which most people are very surprised when they read my poetry that I was drawn to that. 
My argument was that hip hop artists are the most interesting and most skillful contemporary rhymers. I found that they were they rhymed more skillfully than any contemporary poet I could think of. And as a whole, they're certainly more inventive than, than uh, contemporary poets when it came to rhyme. I, I think of rhyme as a challenge, just like I think of all aspects of poetic form as challenges, as useful challenges. So in other words, when we think of a challenge, we normally say, oh, you kind of want to avoid it maybe. But in fact, in poetry, a challenge is something that inspires you. In other words, you set up a certain game in your poem. So the poem that I wrote, um, I, I read you a little earlier, uh, in the world who created according to his will. It was about my, the one about my grandfather we, in bed. I, I thought, you know what? There's a, there's a poem by Wallace Stevens to an old philosopher in Rome where he begins outside of a room and moves inside of Rome. I thought, I'm gonna try that. That's kind of a challenge, it's kind of a game. And you see how it works out. Rhyme can do the same thing. Rhyme, when it works, just like those little narrative tricks, just like a stanza structure, really will give you possibilities that you wouldn't have thought of before. In the, in the happiest circumstance, they're good possibilities. Sometimes they're bad possibilities. But the great one of the great things about poetry is you know you, you go through drafts, you try things out, and if it doesn't work, that's fine. You try something different. So to me, it's really, you know, a poem exists on self-imposed challenges, which which the poet then tries to play with and see what they reveal. Can we talk to us a little bit about your formal writing practice, your discipline of writing, and, and how often you do it and where you do it and how that goes. Well, yeah, but it is, my discipline of writing is fairly undisciplined. <laughs> so I write, I do different kinds of writing. So in other words, I write um, scholarship, I write criticism, I write poetry. And my tactic, my tactic is whatever is going well, I do. So in other words, sometimes I find I'm right, poetry is going really well. Well, then the scholarship is going to have to wait. You know, and I just keep on, I, the poem's going well, I keep on going with the poetry. And similarly, if scholarship's going well, I find that I'm not able to write poems. Uh, so really it's, I don't set myself, I know some poets say, I'm, I'm gonna try to write a poem a day, or I'm gonna try to write an hour a day. I try to, you know, exploit or rather enjoy what's going the best. And I try to, in whatever ends up working, I do. So for example, this might seem trivial. Sometimes I'm sitting in a particular seat and my writing seems to go well. So what that means the next day, I'm gonna go back to that seat. And it may just be, you know, happenstance, but you know, don't mess with it, you know? So if the poems are going well, I'm sticking with the poems. For example, I mentioned to you that my current manuscript, you know, as my father was ill after he passed away, I was very much surprised to have one poem after another, just keep on writing. And so everything else just had to take a back seat. Uh, and that, that's the way I write, is I try to stick with whatever is going, going best. Talk to us about how you approach openings, endings, line breaks. Openings, endings, and line breaks. <laughs> All, okay, very differently. So I would say, you know, for drafts, for openings, again, it begins with some impulse that I'm going to try out. Often that opening is going to be cut. That's a Chekhov's idea that you write the short story and you cut the, be the beginning and the end. Sometimes that works, right? Or what I think of is going to be the order of the poem very much is not. So really the opening in the draft is trying something out. And then you sit down and you say, okay, is this the best? What would happen if I move the third stanza to the first one? And I really don't have a worked out idea of what will happen. I just see what will happen. And then sometimes it's worse, sometimes it's better. I like to have poems balancing, I guess, two conflicting imperatives. One is I like to um, trust and not insult my reader's intelligence. In other words, this, this, I don't like when a poem begins and says, I'm going to tell you five things you need to know before we get into the poem. Then we get into the poem. On the other hand, I don't like to confuse my readers. So, you know, and, and maybe from poem to poem, it'll differ a bit. So, Into My Garden, uh, has a lot of poems set in this Hasidic yeshiva. I tried to put endnotes explaining a few lines. 
At the same time, the pound sequence requires a certain knowledge of pound. I tried to make that poem, I hope, pleasurable even to people who don't know much about Pound, who then might go off to, 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 to read uh, more of his work. In terms of line breaks, I think often it's much more by intuition. You know, there's all different ways to handle line break. There's ways to build up suspense and thwart it or to end a thought. You know, I, I think what you do is you, you know, you, you read a lot of poetry, you try to see what poets are doing, but when you're actually writing a poem, this one, I'm actually writing a poem, I'm not consciously thinking about what the line break should do. In fact, when I come up with an idea for line break and I, and I, and I consciously do it, I pat myself on the back, I think I'm so smart, and the next day I reread it and I think, that's just so obvious, that's ridiculous, that's, you know. So I think it's much more intuitive. Walcott would say, you know, talking about iambic pentameter, he said, I count to five and everything else goes by grace of God. Now, that, I'm not quite at that level, but a lot of it is, a lot of it is, you know, both you read a lot and you try to learn a lot. So at that moment, you have these techniques, but you're not necessarily consciously plotting out. Uh, the, the idea is, at least for me, is the poem should be a lot more entertaining and a lot more intelligent than the poet's. You know, uh, and that's my goal. So if I can tell you what the poem is about and all the ways, then it's it's it's, it's not as interesting, or is it, it's not more interesting and more intelligent than I am. Brother Al. Oftentimes, uh, not just as an educator, but as a poet yourself, there are resource books that you may use or have used or offer for use for the poet. Are there resources that you you offer or refer to yourself? Well, I wrote an introduction to poetic, poetic form called Poetic Form and Introductions. It's probably not the most strikingly original title. So I tried to, and in that book, I gave you know, introductions to different poetic forms, but a big chunk of it are poems themselves. Because what I really feel is you need a brief, uh, an aspiring poet or a critic who's, who's in the stages of learning about the art of poetry, really needs a brief introduction, then he or she needs to read poems. So in other words, I could give an hour lecture on the Sestina, which would be a lot less helpful to a person writing a Sestina than a 15 minute lecture and a lot of examples. So I would say really, um, reading a lot of poetry, less, you know, in a formal sense than out of pleasure. There's, there's, a, there's a great anthology by um, Seamus Heaney and Ted Hughes called Rattle Bag. And they basically pick their favorite poems. And I think each poet, each person that's developing in a poet should have in their own head some of their favorite poems, some poems that they really like, they really admire. And then when they're writing, they say, okay, I admire this quality of this poem. Now I'm going to do something very different and see if I can get that quality. So I would say, you know, there's, there's one book that, uh, uh, that when I wrote my dissertations, poetic, it, it, I, I began by quoting uh, Paul Fussell's poetic meter and poetic form to show why I disagreed with it. And, more, and it's a very slim book. And it's very easy to disparage. And then when I tried to write my own slim introduction, I grew more and more appreciative of Fussell's book. And Fossil definitely has a point of view. So sometimes it's actually most helpful for, for, for an aspiring poet to encounter a view that she or she disagrees with. You know, and say, I'm gonna show this person, you know, that they're wrong. Fossil has very little appreciation for free verse. He doesn't really like it. And a poet who's interested in writing free verse can say, you know what, I'm gonna show Fossil why he's wrong in my poem. So I would say reading poems and reading critics and criticisms as more provocations than laying down the law. There are very few people, very few poets who kind of pragmatically follow some pre-existing treatise on poetry who write great poems out of it. It's more, they're, they're more idiosyncratic and playful. And that, that's what I would encourage. Mm -hmm. David, how can our listeners get hold of your book or books? Well, the easiest way is, I guess, the press is Ben Yehuda Press. If they would just Google into my garden and David Kaplan, one thing your listeners should remember is my last name is with a C, 
just to add a little more degree of difficulty in finding me and my work. Uh, and, you know, people have different attitudes towards Amazon, but my books are certainly there as well as a number of independent booksellers that are all easily accessible on the web. How about reading a last poem for us? Okay. How about, why don't I go back to my uh, most recent book. And why don't I start with the title, which is Into My Garden, which is the title, which is, which is a, a quotation from Song of Songs. But for the people in this um, particular yeshiva, it's also been interpreted by their spiritual leaders, their rebbies in certain ways. Uh, so, um, so the rebbies have kind of understood it. And these boys are reading the commentary on this phrase, Into My Garden. So this is, I guess, a, this again is a poem that I hope people might appreciate without getting all the references, but if, with a few references, I hope they also would deepen their appreciation. So this is a speak. This is a speaker entering yeshiva, listening to the other, listening to these other um, uh, these boys studying this and trying to figure out his own education, the worth of it. So into my garden, as if New Jersey were Babylon. An Argentine and an Israeli argue in Aramaic. Styrofoam cups of instant coffee warm in their hands. Other boys return to last night's commentary. I have come into my garden. Back and forth they sing like an invitation. What did I learn in school? Whenever the philosopher lectured on the death of metaphysics, Holland found an open window, pistol and stamen crazed with each other. Yellow, the serpentine walls and columns. Yellow, the library where church belonged. Some nights, his best student recited the lecture like a pledge, but nothing changed. Not the picture between us, the glass slick with our fingerprints, the envy I felt. Boys dressed like men raced the stairwell as if to the singing, as if to hear what my garden means. Seven generations caused God to withdraw. Seven generations drew him back. All those years of talking, what did I learn? It's funny, again, what I realized is three of the four poems I read end with questions, which I would say is characteristic, but not uniform. And again, the, what I'm contrasting there is in a, in a yeshiva study hall, you read this text aloud in Aramaic or in Hebrew back and forth and the speaker thinking about what his own education was like. Yes, I, personally, if, if poems aren't questioning us or we aren't questioning in the writing of them, we're missing a big part of what poetry really is about. Right. We want to thank our poet today, the educator and poet, David Kaplan. Thank you very much for, for talking with us and reading and sharing your poetry. Alan Tim, thank you very much. This has been a great pleasure indeed. Thank you.